Good evening. Um, I'm delighted this evening to uh, introduce Roddy Doyle to uh, a, an audience which I know includes book groups, general readers um, and members of the, the Louth Library Service. This is one of the, the few literary um, events in a very crowded programme of historical events in relation to the decade of centenaries that Loud Library Service have been running, I know. Um, and it's wonderful to see the, the very large group of people who have registered for this evening's event. And I know that there are also some book groups who are uh, watching this event collectively and, and, and huddled around a screen. So hopefully there will be some really interesting questions later. Um, I'm going to do that thing where people say, I don't need to introduce Roddy Doyle, um, but I also <coughs> am going to introduce Roddy Doyle, so I, I'll do that anyway. Um, his work spans um, theatre, fiction, memoir more recently, uh, and just recently uh, a very zeitgeisty collection of short stories, um, Life Without Children, which is really registering the impact of COVID and isolation on intimate and domestic and family relationships over the last year. Tonight he's going to talk about his foray into historical fiction. Um, a Star Called Henry came out in 1999. It was really the first in a whole series um, of historical fictions which sought to address Irish history from a very different point of view, a, a less reverential point of view, um, a more individual point of view, and also, above all, a, a critical uh, point of view. But A Star Called Henry is very much in the mould of the Dublin novels, for which Roddy Doyle is, is so much respected and uh, indeed loved, and, and which have always been popular in um, the debates around imagining what Irishness is not from a political and official point of view, but from a local, uh, an urban and a familial point of view. So, Roddy, I think you want to read short, a, a brief extract from yeah. early in the novel uh, when Henry is uh, arriving into yeah. the world of the Dublin tenements and slums. Yeah, I started this book, uh, I started writing it in 1995. So um, if I'm, not, I'm not sure how long ago is that, 26 years ago. So I wasn't thinking of centenaries when I wrote it. And um, I was uh, trying to write something that was, for the heck of it at first, just quite different to anything else. It was my um, sixth novel, which is one of the reasons why I went into Dublin's past and started it at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, my work to date had been written um, either in the present day or in the recent past, as in the case of my book, uh, A Star Called Henry. Not, I beg your pardon, Paddy Clark. Ha, ha, ha. So Henry, a kind of larger than life figure, uh, recalls his own birth in this um, extract I'm going to read now. Partly inspired by my own father. He, um, my father never allowed bare facts get in the way of a good story. And um, um, he often recalled his birth. Um, in the Rotunda Hospital and gave vivid details about what was going on at the time. It was just in 1923, at the, the end of the Civil War and the rubble outside on Sackville Street. And he was a great storyteller. And it only occurred to me later on in life that he actually couldn't possibly have remembered any of this stuff. He was um, he was spoofing, which um, it's kind of appropriate that he then uh, produced a novelist. So I'll start now. Granny Nash was putting sheets of newspaper on the mattress, pages of the Evening Mail and the Freeman's Journal. The Baba will have plenty to read anyway, said Mrs. Drake. Mrs. Drake was the local midwife, the handy woman. She was a huge woman, a mass of muscle and slopes that looked like babies' heads bursting to get out. Melody wondered was there one in there for her, hoped and hoped there was. She sat on the chair and watched, watched her mother laying the pages of paper on the bed. The buckets were full. One with hot, the other with cold water. The kettle was steaming. They say if there's news of a war on any of the pages, then it'll be a girl, said Granny Nash. She couldn't read the headlines she was spreading on the mattress. She was finished now. 
The papers were flat and orderly, and her back and her hands were black. Mrs. Drake was over at the window. Don't open it, said Granny Nash, as she gave the papers a last pat, till we've herself down on the paper. Else they'll all blow away on me. Now, my lady, she said to my mother, her daughter, up you get now. Melody stood up out of the chair. Melody, Melody, elephant Melody. It was cruel all over again. It was only 11 months since the last time she'd had to lie down on newspaper. She was struggling the few feet to the mattress. Good girl yourself, said Mrs. Drake. Off you go. Melody lay back on the newspapers. They cracked and rustled under her, and Mrs. Drake lifted the window. That's a grand looking day out there, she said. A smashing day for bringing a baba into the world. The steam dashed to the open window, and the pain dashed through Melody. Stop whinging, said Granny Nash. You'll give the child a hair lip. None of that shitery now, said Mrs. Drake to Granny Nash as she rolled over to Melody. You're in charge of the water. Any more guff out of you, and I'll fling you out the window, and then we'll hear some whinging. And Melody started laughing. More pain thumped her back right off the mattress, but she was still laughing when she landed. Henry waited out on the street. He hadn't wanted to be too near. He paced back and forth, watched at windows by hundreds of people who knew and feared his tap-tap. Henry saw none of them. There was no window of his own to look up at. He was on the wrong side of the house. He went through the house to the yard and looked up at his window. It was open. He listened. Nothing. He couldn't stay there. He felt trapped. His coat was like armour. He'd be to blame if it, if it went wrong again, if the baby didn't live. It was an idea that had become a rock-solid conviction in the time it had taken him to get from Dolly Oblongs to the house. It would be all his fault. He listened as he went to the back door and heard Melody laughing. She pushed. Good girl, there's no rush. Give yourself a rest. Mrs. Drake gathered the sweat from Melody's brow with a cloth that was gorgeously cold. Granny Nash peered between Melody's legs. She didn't have to bend. Get away from there, you, said Mrs. Drake. You'll frighten the baba. Melody laughed and pushed again. Henry, back out in the street, wore half an inch off his leg as he stomped back and back again. He tried leaning on the railings, sitting on the steps, but he couldn't stay still. He had to move. He thought about going for a pint or something smaller and stronger. His nerves were in dire need of settling, but he didn't want to leave his post. She'd laughed. It was years since he'd heard her laughing. He was so frightened. He was terrified that that laugh would be the last thing he'd ever know of Melody and it would be his fault because of what he was. He hadn't noticed it getting dark. It was suddenly night. A bad sign, a bad sign. Poor Henry tried to ignore it. Night followed day. He ignored it, he ignored it. Melody pushed. Henry's leg got shorter and shorter. He listened to the fading echo of his wife's laughter. Melody pushed. He tried to hear, tried to remember it. He hadn't noticed that he was listening dangerously, dangling over the basement steps. Melody heaved. Her back was turning to screaming stone. It's a hairy head. Get out of my light. Melody cupped, sorry, Mrs. Drake cupped the head of her in her magical mitts. The warmth of it, she said and sighed. There's power there, I'll tell you. Welcome home, my treasure. Melody, Melody pushed again. Henry toppled into the well of the basement. Melody pushed, and I, me, Henry Smart, the second or third, came charging into the world on a river of water and blood that washed the news off the papers. Melody fell back on the mattress. Mrs. Drake held me up by the legs. She dangled me for all to see, like an almighty salmon she couldn't believe she'd caught. It's a lad, Mrs. Melody, she said. He must be more than a stone. A lad in a feck and half he is. His cord is as wide as me wrist. She slapped my arse and the air around us sang. Granny Nash blessed herself, then high-tailed it out the door to tell my father. Henry, my dad, looked up from where he'd landed on his back on the rubbish and waste blown down from the street. A shooting star went scooting across the black sky over Dublin. Henry forgot his pain and whooped. He saw Granny Nash squinting through the railings, trying to find him in the gloom and rubbish. I know, said Henry, I know. Where were the three wise men? Where were the sheep and the shepherds? They missed it, the fucking Egypts. They were following the wrong star. They missed the birth of Henry Smart, Henry S. Smart, the one and only me. On the 8th of October, 1901, at, at 22 minutes past seven. They all missed it. Mrs. Drake was there. Her hands that cupped my head tingled for the rest of her great long life. Granny Nash was there. 
She picked up the free man's journal and discovered that she could read. And my parents, they were happy. For a tiny moment in their hard, hard lives, my mammy and daddy were happy. There you go. There's a, a box in the bottom of the screen for those who are listening, um, which says, ask a question. Um, and that's very much what we would want you to do now at this point. Um, and in the meantime, I get to ask a few of my own um, whilst we're, we're waiting for a few to come in. Um, Granny Nash. Mm. She is really important at the beginning and really important at the end of the book. Is she a kind of anti Mother Ireland? They... I'm I'm not altogether sure. Um, yeah, to a degree. Um, I immersed myself in social history and this this city. You know, a book like this, for example, which I I found again today, Dublin Tenement Life. It's a wonderful oral history of um, by an, uh, an American man, Kevin Kearns, who went around with a tape recorder and recorded people's. Um, reminiscences of the turn of the century. And um, it was very vivid, full of images, full of little details that I was able to use and bring myself closer to Dublin as it would have been then. And I think to a degree, Granny Nash is a result of the just the sheer harshness of life, you know? Uh, and they, uh, the softness has been knocked out of her, I suppose. Uh, a little bit like Melody, except Melody, Melody is an old woman when she's still very young. I mean, there's a, the passage before um, I can't remember how many stillborn children or children who didn't survive infancy there were. And um, Henry himself, I, there's a passage, the, the, the Henry's father, there's a passage before just that section I read, which I noticed that the, um, he's old at 26, you know. So I think that's where Granny, Granny Nash came from, really. It, um, but I also... I was deliberately writing in a way that was very different to my previous books, which is nothing whatsoever to do with Irish history, but it was more, I was giving physical details and um, descriptions to characters that ordinarily I wouldn't do, you know? So she became a, a very small woman and she has, you know, uh, a way of dressing and that I wouldn't, if I'd been writing um, in a contemporary setting, I wouldn't have bothered, you know, with those descriptions at all. So in a way she's, Having decided to write in this style, she just grew out of it, really. And uh, I love the idea of this miraculous discovery of reading and then becoming really voracious, not not only voracious, but criminal in her. <laughs> in her yeah. Hoovering <laughs> up every book in Dublin, you know. I, yeah. I just loved that. You know, this, this, um, this, uh, I mean, I find reading, uh, even today, uh, quite a joyful experience, you know, just a, it's a wonderful mm. experience. But I think she just, having discovered late in life that she can read, she's just mopping the stuff up, really. That, 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 again, it, it's not, there's not much joy in her reading. I love the the uh, image of, of Henry stealing women writers for her yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in exchange for information, the, the kind yeah. of transaction that goes on. That's yeah, great. again, that, that was a whimsical thing in a way. I got... Um, yeah. My American publisher, a woman called uh, Caroline White, sent me um, uh, Penguin over in America had published this um, book, like a catalogue, a very extensive catalogue of women's writing, American women's writing uh, throughout, you know, the, the, the history, the, the colonization of America. And it was fascinating just going through this stuff. And at first I was saying, I wonder how many of these I've read. And there were, you know, Maya Angelou and uh, Tony Morrison and um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston and people who I'd read, but then there were others I'd never heard of, you know, including ex-slaves and people like that, re recounting their experiences. And it was a brilliant, a brilliant read. So a lot of the more obscure titles that Granny Nash craves, the books by women, um, they came out of that catalogue. Uh, okay, because I was wondering about the slave narrative and that it comes Mm. You know that she 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 likes that or she reacts to that, but Castle Rackrent is all rubbish. Basically, I think isn't that the, the phrase? You, <laughs> you are you're having you're having fun with the canon of literature in in this figure of this ferocious kind of woman in the slums yeah. making her judgments. Yeah, um, and I I, 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 
and and that slum and and tenement um reality i mean you talk there about giving the physical details and mm. this this sense that that henry is miraculous because he's a normal sized baby he's he's a healthy child yeah. you know in this world of illness i, th- I thought the there's a real physical sense of them all ailing, you know, the coughing, yeah, and and the the stunting of of people's potential, but also literally of their of their bodies in it. Yeah. Um. Was that that something you were trying with the book to to get a a sense of these people who were who are sort of crushed and squashed, like I mean, Melody, yeah. where, where the pregnancies have worn her out in her early twenties. Yeah, the child mortality rate in Dublin, if I remember, was it was ferocious. It was terrible. Uh, I think it was worse than uh, Moscow on the eve of, on the eve of revolution. You know, and um, uh, I mean, also, you know, I, I recall that even in the nineteen sixties, when I was growing up, I think. If I if I go to in my imagination, go from house to house at the estate where I lived in, there was a um, there was a dead child in a lot of those families. It was yeah, it was uh, that, and that's now the fifties and sixties, and um, I had a a brother. It, it's a strange way that it, 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 it almost defies grammar, but I had a brother who died two years before me, you know, and was never. Um, he was in the Angels plot in Last Nevin. My mother never saw him. Uh, he was taken away the, uh, the minute he was born. My father saw him, but my mother wasn't allowed to see him. I think the thinking was it was it was kinder not to let her see the baby because the baby wasn't going to live. Yeah. And I grew up knowing this, and um, my mother was very open about it, uh, and I'm grateful uh, to her for that. But uh, so I never felt too far away. I grew up, you know, the house I grew up in was very comfortable, you know, um, three bedrooms, you know. So I'm not trying to put myself in a, in, a, in an inner city tenement. But I do recall my father worked in Bolton Street, the College of Technology in Bolton Street. And now and again, I can't remember why, but I'd be going in there with him. And, uh, you know, we'd be walking by the tenements, you know, then that were kids pouring in and out of the tenement still when I was a child. And that that was, you know, that was there in my head as I started to write. And of course, you know, sometimes a street name like Summer Hill, it's a, um, you know, brilliant name. I mean, now it's a wide, you know, up, up as far as Parnell Street, it's, a, it's just a wide avenue really that was designed to get traffic in and out of Dublin. But at the time, the name is still there. And I, I could attach images to the name, so to speak. You know, that when I'd come across a street that I actually knew, uh, it was a big help to allow me to imagine the fictional character walking along the same street. I hope I'm making sense. Photographs were a great, great help. Um, and there was no shortage of photographs. Um, and also I remember reading Strumpet City, which is a brilliant uh, uh, descriptive piece of work, and, and Ulysses as well. And anything at all that I thought would bring me closer to the um, to what life might have been like, really. But um, I suppose from the very, very beginning, it was a fight for survival, really. I was talking to somebody uh, recently. They were telling me all about the games they used to play. Grew up in the inner city, all the games they used to play. And it was almost as if all the games were designed to teach a bit of street wisdom, to get that street wisdom into it. It was about money almost. It was about economics and the games and the things that they did. It was all about making a penny here. And it was all really about survival and um, getting ready for this fight. Yeah, there's a great sense of the novel of how fragile these lives are. Mm. Before, even before, there's any political violence, that there's any revolution. Yeah, that lives are, are really, really fragile. Like, like Victor. Um, I mean, there's a lot there. I can see there's questions coming through right. from a, a number of people. And um, Michelle Duffy. Um, says she loves the way you wove Henry into the history of the GPO mm. and as one of the people who became the so-called 12 apostles of Michael Collins 
Um, and here's a leading question. Do you think you got a realistic view of what happened at the GPO and Michael Collins' men? Who, me as a writer? I, well, I think that's what she's asking you all, right? Yeah, yeah I think... Which is a, well, yeah. From the writing point of view, one of the great things about 1916 is that so many of it took place in one building. So much of it. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of easy to capture, really. Or it's, there was a lot of um, there's a lot of good stuff to read. And, uh, you know, uh, up until the pandemic, I could go into the GPO anytime I wanted. And I, I, have, I, I regularly do and just stand in the middle of it and look around and try to, you know, um, imagine uh, it uh, in different circumstances. And I was thinking as well of um, Insurrection, the television series that was on when I was a child. I was eight in 1966. It had a huge impact, not just on me, but every kid in Kilbarrick where I grew up on the north side of Dublin. We were out playing the day after. Instead of Cowboys and Indians, it was, you know, 1916 we were playing. And a lot of that was focused on the GPO and barricades and things like that, you know. And, Half a Kilbarrick was a building site, so barricades were great, you know, you could, you know, bits of wood. You could create them. So um, I think the great, again, if you're trying to capture a veteran of the First World War, I'd imagine it would be really, really difficult to try to achieve in the, in the, in the covers of a book. It has been done and brilliantly, but um, one life through four years, uh, you'd have to pick and choose. But I found you know with the gpo because they were only in there really less than a week and i have kind of deliberately skipped one day you know because one day rolls into the other so henry can't account can't account for that day but through different sources it was quite achievable to find out almost minute by minute what was going on in there and the physical stuff i thought was brilliant you know when it started to heat up uh, and the roof began to heat and the glass dome began to melt. I thought, well, this is brilliant stuff. This is extraordinary stuff. So um, on one level, you're trying to be, you know, Henry deliberately builds up the story and makes more of it very often than is actually physically possible. But so at one level, I was trying to be realistic, but also seeing it through his eyes. So making more, a bit more than was actually there, you know? And um, of course, I couldn't I, I, I couldn't re resist the temptation of sex in the GPO during the height of the um, uh, during the height of the rising. I you, thought it'd it be a wasted opportunity. <laughs> you got a bit of flack over that, I have to say. I, and, I mean, I think that one of the things about the way you portray uh, Miss O'Shea, who who comes back in so many different guises. Mm. Um, I mean, she starts out as the lovely school teacher, and she ends up as a an IRA assassin, which is a pretty interesting trajectory for for a character. Um, I mean, you were, were very deliberately, and you do you, you name check the women and, and the role that the women had. Mm. And um, for remember the Sisters in Army, Henry doesn't seem to be too averse to Constance Markievicz. Um, you know that the, there is a sense that there is in the novel that the women are. Um, not just active participants, but also there's an irreverence. I mean, that's that yeah. scene between the two of them in the GPO. And she's very much the initiator of that. He thinks yeah. he knows everything, and yeah, she well, teaches him a thing or two. I, I you know, uh, went to a Christian Brothers school in first year. The reading for civics class was, believe it or not, on Fublock and the United Irishman. We were told to get them outside the GPO and bring them in for civics. And uh, this would have coincided, it was the same year as, say, Bloody Sunday and the burning of the British Embassy. And um, uh, I mean, extraordinary times, but you were watching on the news, you know, every day. And that's the kind of depiction of um, our Irish history became very simplified and then disappeared off the syllabus for a while. It was the good versus the bad. That's what we were taught, you know. And uh, I had great fun messing with that, really. And uh, the whole, um, you know, the absence of sex education in school and whenever it got a mention, it was always, you know, oh, it's a bit dirty, you know. There was a priest in the local parish. He used to rail against the English newspapers, the Sunday papers. And he used words like filth, 
It was marvellous stuff. I was a teenager, myself and my brother sitting, standing at the back of the church, lapping this stuff up, thinking the man was a, a nut, you know? You could almost see the sweat on his, uh, on his, on his forehead as he railed against all the filth or whatever. And, and so there was a certain uh, fun to be had. And also, I, I wanted the women to be kind of unhappy with their allotted role. The women that in the Mano, uh, what's it called, come on, them on women. Come were, on, on. They went down to the basement basically to make the soup and sandwiches, you know. And that's not why Miss O'Shea joined up. Really, that's not what she signed up for. There's a great book. Uh, I got it in Kilmainham Jail, another place I wandered around for a while before it was um, done up. And it was a terrific book. And I'm trying to remember the author's name. It was a small book, brilliant images with it as well, Guns and Chiffon, which I thought was a terrific. Oh, yeah. That's a great title. Yeah, Isn't it? I yeah. So I thought, yeah, why can't elegance and revolution go hand in hand? And um, I'd been aware, I, I, I read a good bit about Sean O'Casey when I was a student. It's very, uh, a big, big um, fan, I suppose, of Sean O'Casey. But I'd read his stuff on the Citizens' Army as well, and he really detested uh, Countess Markovich. And um, I just didn't want to replicate that, really, I suppose. Um, I didn't know whether it was misogyny or whether it was a class thing or... Uh, whether he felt threatened by her or women generally, I don't know. But um, uh, I think what throughout the the, the, the the Henry books, I'd like to think that when Henry looks at women, he sees interesting people, he sees intelligent people, he sees, you know, he sees excitement and he sees... Um, uh, he sees, what would you say... All, if you like, to my mind, all the good things of that would, would that, that occur when you when you meet somebody special, you know, uh, intellectually engaging, uh, all these things, uh, kindness, all the stuff. So, um, Miss O'Shea, it was great fun just calling her Miss O'Shea throughout the book as well, you know, and that he avoided, <laughs> he, he desperately avoided finding out what her name was. That was great crack. <laughs> uh, on which note the library service and library services are great for this uh, have pointed out that that's Sinead McCool's book The, the Women Revolutionaries in Kilmaine and Guns and Ship and that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, wouldn't come to my mind there at, at the beginning I have it so there's a lot yeah, to, um, and she's I mean she's done so much work on, on the women of that period um, mm. there's a lot of different questions coming in now um, uh, Bernie Bradley saying how lovely it is to see you and how much she admires your skill in describing people and lives. Mm -hmm. But Thank she you. wonders if you prefer writing about times and lives gone by like this book or more contemporary books. I think possibly I've written 12 novels and I think most of them, I think eight of the 12 are set in whatever the present day was when I wrote the book, so which would seem to suggest that I prefer that. And Certainly the book, the novel I've started, number 13, is also set in the present day, bang in the middle of it. If, if it's possible to be bang in the middle of the present day, that's where it's set. Uh, so I, I think I probably prefer the present day, although I loved the adventure of going backwards in time and uh, kind of in a way hauling my own sensibilities with me and family legend and uh, the interest in history and kind of bringing it back it wouldn't have been a hundred years, but close to a hundred years when I um, when I describe Henry's birth, and I really and my knowledge of Dublin uh, and my lack of knowledge of Dublin, I liked bring I liked doing that. It was really um, and, and quite deliberately. I wasn't in, in any hurry, so it took uh, took three years to write that book, which is you know it's a it's a sizable chunk of anybody's life, but I think. Yeah, if the gun was put to me head and you're, I was told, well, you can only write books set in the past or in whatever the present day is, I'd go for the present day, I think. You'd only do the right thing that. Um, there's a question actually related to that, um, which has come in. Was it a strange writing experience grafting a fictional character like Henry onto historical characters like Michael Collins? 
and and did you feel and mm. I presume with the film and everything people have really strong expectations of what Collins is going to be like did, was that a uh, it's a challenge but it's also true. it's kind of fun I I really I, I kind of enjoyed it I mean I've encountered it before where fictional characters rub shoulders with real people and um, it was the first time I was doing it but I thought you know are there any rules here do I, you know are there any things I cannot do ever and the answer was always coming back no there aren't I can do what I want and um, so I liked the fictional version of Collins that I created he's kind of ruthless and boyish and um, scheming and thick at the same time in some ways but uh and i liked also I, I when i say i like this is the storyteller in me if you like this is where i didn't it's not something when i say i like i liked being as a writer i liked being able to sort of introduce the thread of anti-semitism running through it as well you know because yeah. it's ugly you know it's really really ugly and i think i suppose we feel as a, as a country that was neutral during the war, we feel immune. The, the Jewish population is very, very small. How could we possibly be anti-Semitic? But it's there, and it, the, the evidence is there. So it was, it was, um, and I knew that people, I suppose, you know, uh, the style of writing that I have done and have been doing, and if, if you if you stick your head up, somebody's going to want to, you know, hit, hit uh, you know, hit you over the head. Uh, so I was, I was no stranger to um, criticism. So I knew that I would get it in the neck when I, when the book was published. But that, again, was part of the the fun. I was dealing with what I suppose you'd call pieties, really. Uh, again, it's going back to the good versus evil. And um, I just, uh, I, I, I'm wary of the word fun because I think it's overused. So it wasn't fun as such writing the book, but it never is. It was, it's, um, it's quite an intense process, but it was. Um, I'm, I'm getting nitpicky with words. I suppose it was immensely satisfying doing this sort of stuff, and uh, you know, particularly the, the world of the Christian brothers that I grew. Well, I spent five years of my life with, where there were strict notions of what what Irishness was, what was right, what was wrong. It was great to be able to tumble these you know if that makes sense it does make sense uh, it is a mock heroic book isn't it i mean there is a lot of mockery of yeah men who take themselves too seriously yeah. and and the the weak spots and and the yeah. dark spots in in the yeah I'd, I'd, alleged I'd, heroes. I'd be a huge uh, a great admirer particularly as a writer of ernie o'malley uh, I loved his books, you know, um, on another man's wounds, and I, I can't recall the other one. And I read them several times as I was writing the book, but I kind of imagined them that he could also be insufferable, you know. So Henry has a, a, a little polite dig at him when they're sitting beside each other on the side of a hill, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is? You know, I can't so it's, remember. It's, it's very meta. It's a very meta novel because all the books. That, I mean, the research is. I know I've heard two, story, two historians talking about the book shortly after it came out and they were very, very impressed when you were dealing with anti-Semitism that you had the, the Jewish character come from the right part of, he was an, a Latvian Jew, so you had the you had exactly right, right where he came from. I so there's tons of, of the detail I, like that. Yeah, Mr. Tremanus, I got him, my mother's uncle was a man called Robert Brennan and he was uh he married and my mother was called bulger and her family came from wexford robert brennan was one of the people and his wife my my mother's aunt una were one of the people who uh brought the rising if you like to enniscorthy and he was involved in the was it the bulletin the propaganda sheet that the, that Sinn fein brought out i think every day during the war of independence and later was the first ambassador to the United States. And he wrote a, he wrote these potboiler novels. Where he got the time, I don't know. You know, he was on the run all the time. And then later, Maeve Brennan, the short story writer, was his daughter. Uh, so she would have been my mother's first cousin. 
But Robert Brennan wrote a, what I think is a brilliant um, memoir of the War of Independence called Allegiance. And he uh, was around Orwell Road, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, having to um, get off the street just at curfew. And the, I think that li quite literally there was a black and tan tender swinging around the corner, knocked at a door of a man he knew, and it was this uh, Mr. Clemanus, a Jewish man. So I, I kind of, as a tribute almost to a man I never knew, because Robert Brennan died when I was very young, but my mother spoke of him very fondly and his, and her Aunt Una, and I knew Maeve Brennan myself when I was a child. I kind of lifted it from allegiance and put it into a star called Henry. So I have him to thank for the accuracy, not my own uh, intellectual vigour. Um, I just read a piece by a young critic called Tracy McAvenue recently in Limerick who talked about houses in, in Maeve Brennan and talking about the impact mm -hmm. of what the Black and Tan raids must have done when she yeah. was a tiny child. And yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a... It's a that sense of danger and the safe houses and mm. the that's really relying on the kindness of strangers isn't it um you know, when yeah. you know you some, but. yeah you get some people who clearly enjoyed that life in a way mm. uh, you, th you get the sense that michael collins was built for it and others it must have chipped away at their um i don't know their nerve ends uh, constantly being alert falling asleep in the knowledge that you might have to wake up any minute or you mightn't wake up at all. Uh, it, it, it can't have, um, uh, I always, I often wonder that, that phrase, what do you do when the revolution is over? I mean, what these people did when it was all over, um, it must've been very, very difficult psychologically speaking. Uh, must have been very difficult. Can't, they can't have been easy to live with, some of those people, after the war was over. But your, your novel definitely implies that the the Alfie Gantons and the Ivers and the people that can, Ivans, the people that can come out of it on top, um, out of a period like that, in control and see the opportunities for themselves, yeah. um, that the basically the worst of them almost got to take over the country when it was all over because yeah it's a, it's kind of a, it's also a bit of a romantic notion that I, you know what would it have been like if michael collins had lived um you know you could spend all night talking about that with, with the right people or the wrong people <laughs> um <laughs> you know and it's always i mean it's it's a simple you know a uh, john lennon is revered because he died young, Paul McCartney is often sneered at because he's, he's had the temerity to stay alive a good deal longer, you know? Yeah. So there's often a romance attached to the people who die young. But um, it is quite remarkable, I think. It's one of the things that I suppose it is, it'll be forever mystifying really how a lot of the, the men really who were to the forefront of the revolution became so conservative, or they were maybe from the very beginning, but they, they took off the uniform and donned the, the grey suit or whatever colour it was. And, and it's almost schizoid, really, that they, they, they went from one extreme almost to a different extreme. And uh, it's hard to account for. It's hard, to, it's, it's hard, I think, from where we're sitting now, it's hard to make sense of that, really. When you see some of them in later life, and even not in later life, when they're, they're in their civilian gear in the, 1960, in the 1920s even, it's hard to imagine that some of those men um, had been on the barricade, so to speak. Yeah, and, and that sense that you get from the women that fought with them, that, that huge oh. sense of disappointment, who thought yeah. these were their comrades, and now they were passing laws to say they couldn't stay and work. You get yeah. this sense of shock at the time, don't you, as well? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they inevitably, the bitterness as well. And, of course, it's a recurring thing. It's all you know, the women who were allowed work in factories until the end of the war, Women who were allowed to play, you know, we, we, we find it all over the world. Women who were allowed to play baseball until the end of the war. You know, things that aren't, you know, things that can't happen, happen, and then they're taken back again, you know. So, again, yeah, it must have been really, um, I think, yeah, particularly for a woman who just wanted to express herself as herself unapologetically, openly, who we would see as a very modern consciousness or whatever, it must have been 
so suffocating, you know. It really so suffocating. Yeah, yeah. Um, Martin, and, and you, the, the stories we hear, particularly during the uh, the twenty the twenty sixteen commemorations, that the 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 women who are in relationships with one another, even buried together, there's a um, there are wonderful stories that I'm not sure have really been told there yet. You know how they could live their lives almost semi openly. Um, how they manage it, I don't know. Oh, brilliant yeah. yeah brilliantly but i mean that's very much part of that other history of dublin that mm. you get in, in this book this sense of parallel dublins you know that the official version and then this other ver like yeah. like all those underground rivers that you map out yeah so uh, lovingly in the novel that, that there's a sense of another another history flowing my over. thesis is that as well the um I wouldn't call it a thesis, but I've always felt that I can only speak for Dublin, really, but working class Dubliners come to a realization sometimes that things have to change year, years before legislation is enacted. So I think the whole notion of legitimacy was finally dealt with. And the whole idea of a legitimate or illegitimate child was removed from law, I think, in 1987. But really, in working class areas in Dublin, it had been removed decades long before the fact yeah which is one of the reasons i wrote the snapper which i started in 1986 and i think um the whole idea the the working class people stopped going to church going to mass years before the churches in middle class areas began to you know uh, reduce the number of masses on a sunday uh, so i think it's not recorded really and i'm not sure if it's ever acknowledged but i think even the even um, tolerance for gay people, I think, came in working class areas before the Irish Times cottoned on to it. I don't want to sneer there too much, but I think it's um, it's actually true. Yeah. You know, I think it's actually true. So there was the, if you like, the official Dublin, and then there's the Dublin that was getting on with the, getting on with its own business, really, and ignoring. I loved the. Um, not that I've advocated, but I love the whole looting stuff that happened during the, 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 the 1916 rising and the sheer variety of things. When you, when you read into it, and the, like Sean O'Casey, of course, captures it absolutely brilliantly. The stuff that was being hauled <laughs> through the streets. Yeah. Of <laughs> you know, you can see why some, yeah, anything, anything can be sold, of course, but it was just, it was, it was an opportunity, you know, and of course, you know, to, to rob during the revolution is a, a, a crime punishable punishable by death, but it, can, it was an opportunity. Yeah, you, that, that, the bit in the novel where he actually acknowledges that those women who turned up for their remittances had kids to feed. Yeah. And that this was, you know, just the reality of, of yeah. lives. Uh, but also, um, I, I love the bit where he shoots Tyler's shop window. I think that's, that's a great moment, you know, of <laughs> an attack on consumerism before you even knew what consumerism was. Yeah. There, there are a couple of questions um, about Henry and his name. Henry. Because you've got, and his name, um, yeah. and that fact that he changes his name so much uh, mm. in the course of the novel, um, and, and when he's being interrogated and when he's on the run, he has all these multiple identities. Um, and there, there were a couple of people asking if this harks back to the beginning of his life when his mother couldn't say his name because and his father wouldn't yeah. say his name and all these you know there's, there's Henry the father the son and the annoying yeah. ghost of his poor unfortunate little brother well, before older brother there's two things at work there there's um there are two entirely separate things the brother who I mentioned, who I was born in 1958 and he was born in 1956 and uh, he was called Roderick as as I was. So it often intrigued me if he had lived, who would I be? Um, and then I had a younger brother. This is when I was a child. Who would he be? Uh, would I be him? And if I was him, <laughs> would he be there at all? And I suppose in many ways, in that childish way, the whole a whimsical nature of life and somehow or other made it through. but uh, so I had the name of somebody who had had died um, and uh, it's always in a way intrigued me 
So I think it was in tenement, uh, Dublin Tenement Life, that, that oral history that I held up there, the um, uh, Kevin Kearns book, the whole idea of the stars and the, being dead children shining down. And uh, the, the image of his mother looking up and choosing a star and saying, that's her Henry. And of course, you know, uh, I'm not sure. I think it's in the book. You know, the, 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 your name is the only thing you own. And um, he's been told that, it, you know, it's not his name. And um, so I think the whole idea of the first, second and third Henry's, I mean, I was named after my father as well. It's, you know, it's not uncommon, as you know. So it, it was the one that was my father, who was known as Rory, but it was Roderick was his uh, the, the name on his passport, I think, or on his birth cert. Then there was the, the, the baby who hadn't lived, and then there was myself. So it was always a question, of, am I the third one or the second one, or what's going on there? And the the, the, the whole idea of his name, the surname, um, its roots are more comical. A friend of mine, a teacher, uh, Stephen Byrne, now dead, unfortunately, but worked in the same school as me, he had a, a, a GA18, and uh, whenever they were playing, he'd bring the list of the players, all the 15 lads, into the staff room to ask one of the Irish teachers to translate their names into Irish, because the, the, um, the team sheet has to be delivered in Irish. And it's easier said than done when you're living in a city, even in the 1980s, when before, you know, Dublin became a magnet for people from all over the world, there were you know, English surnames and things like that. So there was a there was a guy who I met there not uh, fairly recently, James Smart. And I think he was playing in goal. And the teacher uh, translated his name into Seamus O'Dlick. <laughs> <laughs> it got a great laugh, reasonably enough. And he was, a, you know, he was a, a smart kid. And he was a really nice fella. And he's a very nice adult. Um, and uh, so that name stuck. So I just thought, if I, if I call him Henry Smart, given the times and people changing their names, and I was always intrigued by uh, the reinvention. My mother's aunt, Una, was Anastasia. And then, you know, she joined um, uh, the, the Gaelic League and became Una. And um, my father was born on the 8th of, the, 8th of December, 1923, which was the first uh, anniversary of the execution of Rory O'Connor who was Roderick O'Connor and then changed his name to Rory. So my father was christened Roderick, but was always known as Rory. So uh, I just liked the idea of Henry having this flexible name that he can use it any way he wants. Again, it was part of the, I didn't have any set decisions. I rarely do when I start a book. I kind of come to decisions of that you know that idea has legs i'll keep on that and that's going nowhere i'll have to deal with that when i'm working on the second draft but i'm not going to be thinking about that one anymore and some ideas seem to last and others just fizzle out and i think the the whole idea of the names was um was important somehow and i think it's probably somehow uh, in my psyche somewhere you know that that's why i was um uh, messing with the names really um there's a question there about, um, which I suppose is, is, is coming back to you as a writer again, and um, asking how you have found the past 18 months in terms of writing. Wow. Because writers often say writing's very solitary, so was mm. it much of a change for you? Um, yeah. and, and what have you been writing? Um, well, I have, in a way, I served my apprenticeship and so far as I, when I gave up teaching in 19... 93, uh, I chose to spend my working day alone in a room, really, you know, and that's usually nine to five or nine to six, a bit flexible, uh, Monday to Friday. And uh, that's the norm. This is my office here where I'm sitting and I normally spend a good chunk of the working day here in the office by myself. Uh, so in that way, nothing changed, but there's a huge difference, as we know, between uh, working alone and being uh, forced to stay indoors. And um, I had been, uh, I, it was March last year, I had started a novel. I was 
beginning to it was beginning to flow. And I was away the week before the lockdown. And then, you know, when I got home and it was around about St. Patrick's Day and everything was shut and the streets were empty. And I opened up the novel to see where I was. It no longer made any sense. It just was ridiculous. The present day that I was trying to capture a month before didn't exist. And actually I had to realize it, it was no longer going to exist. So I set it aside at first and I eventually binned it because I, it, it, it wasn't going to, the first time I think I've ever been uh, anything like that. At the same time, I began to think of short stories. I thought short stories might be the way to capture the, because it became quite quickly apparent that the mood was changing. The kind of, even listening to the radio, the giddy excitement of sourdough and yoga classes. And it was quite apparent that there were people fighting for their few minutes on the radio, that this was a new industry almost, you know, that there was so much happening and the language was changing. Droplets, which we would have thought was a lovely little word, suddenly became a lethal word. Masks, mm -hmm. mandatory. Uh, I remember I was in the UK when the lockdown started here. When I came home, because the UK was taking a different, was going in a different direction, social distance, when I arrived in Dublin Airport, there were all the signs were there, and I, I wasn't even altogether clear whether we were supposed to try and maintain a social distance in the house as well. And I was wondering, well, how is that physically possible? How are we going to manage that? So I was behind in a way. It took me a while to catch up. But I used that in one of the short stories, and then it began to... Masks became mandatory, and then suddenly this new rubbish began to appear on the grounds. Litter, masks, which really struck me as quite shocking at first, to see a mask on the ground. Uh, almost like a, you know, a personal item that should never be on the ground. And so I used the story that, and then, I, you know, I tried to imagine a young nurse witnessing a death for the first time, and that became a story. So uh, there's a, the book, uh, Life, Life Without Children, is a collection of stories that I wrote between March last year and March this year. And it was terrific in a way to be able to use the anxiety that I felt, the uh, the fact that the house, you know, that the two of me, three children were in the house, one of them working, that there were three people working in the house instead of one, that you had to be careful about, you know, uh, noise, uh, that the worry about how long will this go on, and, you know, the, the trek out to the supermarket, whose turn is it as if it was like, you know, Scott at the Antarctic, somebody leaving the tent and never coming home. Um, so I tried to capture all of this. Well, you can never capture all of this, but I tried to capture moments in that that year in the different short stories. So it was, um, I don't think writing's ever therapeutic, but it certainly was useful. It was great to be able to harness a lot of these feelings and see if I could find the words for them. You know, that was great. Because everything else was, um, everything else I had, set up for the year was either cancelled or postponed you know so uh, this anyway kept me going uh, so it was a difficult um i mean there are degrees of difficulty and you know um one is almost reluctant to speak sometimes about you know because nobody close to me died didn't have the anxiety of elderly parents to look after my children are adults and well capable of looking after themselves so no homeschooling you know um so in in many ways it was uh, relatively easy but i think it was the isolation particularly uh january february march of this year i found particularly hard or heavy going um, i realized at one point i had i actually hadn't been in direct contact with anybody outside my immediate family in months and began to phone people didn't zoom just on an old-fashioned phone call where you don't actually have to stare at the person <laughs> you just just you know hold the thing up to your ear while you're watching football with the sound down it was terrific so that actually you know a was a big but i'd forgotten that you could do that you know that you could just phone somebody on it so um but uh yeah i think now the challenge for me and i'm involved in several projects where it is the challenge is where to where to start the story now is it safe to assume it's all over? No, I don't think it is. But is it, is it safe to start a story without it being 
if you like, drenched in the pandemic, so to speak? Can we write a story that just happens to be taking place at this time? So that's the challenge now. It's an interesting one, you know. Or if you want to write something post-pandemic, when can you safely say that is because, you know, I think forever uh, people of certainly people of my age and possibly all adults will always will always now for the rest of our lives think somehow in terms of pre and post. Yes. Um, I mean, that's really interesting in that short story where it's Alan, isn't it? Just the character and he thinks, well, his life can go. He could leave his passport and not go back as if he could yeah. somehow run away from it all. And, and yeah. But that since this is a definitive break and things yeah. will. But the idea, I was always intrigued, well, not always, but uh, I read this really interesting article about people in New York uh, at the time of 9-11. I can't remember how many people were cited and named who saw it as an opportunity just to disappear in the chaos. They just saw it, here's the chance. And uh, it'd be very hard to disappear now, I think, you know, CCT. You'd need your COVID search, wouldn't you, to disappear <laughs> with you? So you'd, leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you'd never be able to buy a cup of coffee again. <laughs> Good point. I won't bother writing that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there's a, a question from uh, Michelle again. She's she's asking about the trilogy um, and saying, that, you know, this is the first. The Star Called Henry was is the first book in a trilogy. Um, and for especially for people who've, who've read this first book now as part of the book clubs and so on, where do the other books lead Henry? And, and why did you continue his journey and, and not just stop at that book? Um, sometimes when you, you're looking back, you wonder why indeed, why didn't I just stop it? I thought I liked the challenge. I liked the, the notion leaves Ireland at the end of this book goes to the United States, a kind of obvious place to go, confronts, if you like, in many ways, Irish America and other things that are happening there, then comes back to Ireland. And I like the idea of him, you know, much older, uh, battle-worn in many, many ways, coming back to this place that roughly coincides with my childhood. You know, and that was familiar to me. So I deliberately made him the caretaker of a school, which basically is the primary school I went to. And um, uh, I just thought there was enough, you know, and, and at some point, to be honest with you, sometimes you're writing a book, like the, the middle one, um, oh, play that thing. Uh, if I did a lot of research for about the 1916 Rising, I mean, the research that you can do about the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression, <laughs> you could know, spend thousands of lives just yeah. glossing over the thing, you know? And that was a you know that cliche the rabbit hole. I really went down that <laughs> down that rabbit hole, listening to exclusively to jazz of the nineteen twenties and looking as for as many films as I could find of the nineteen twenties, having a great time, like a really really great time. Um, so I kind of immersed myself in that. And once you do, you're not going to back away and say no. I think I'll do something else now. I did take a break from him. I wrote a book called Paula Spencer between. Oh, play that thing, and then the last one, The Dead Republic, because I wanted to um, try and capture something of the present day uh, in that book. It took me a year. Then I went back to The Dead Republic, and we're back to pieties, really. And I like the idea of Henry confronting the men with the beards, you know, the, the people who think they, have, they now hold the chalice. Interesting times. Um, you know, the burying of the guns on uh, the emergence of Sinn Féin as a, as a, as a popular party. And uh, Henry is there to see it, the beginning of it. And um, I thought it was really enjoying writing that because I thought there was something um, almost, and I don't mean this in a literal sense, but something slightly, almost in terms of the writing, dangerous about it, you know. And I don't mean, as I said, I don't mean in a literal sense. I never felt any sense of threat. And I've had conversations with Republicans who have enjoyed a lot of my work, but didn't didn't like uh, A Star Called Henry uh, or the other books. But good chats with them about it, you know. So I never felt any hostility in that sense. But I just thought, again, it was back to, if you like, if, if Henry as a dig at old pieties, I felt I was beginning to have a dig at the new pieties. 
So the, the, the dead republic is where you have that transition point into the one the republic we live in now. Yeah, and again, his his way back to Ireland is that he, he accompanies John Ford, the film director, who's going to make that great uh, example of socialist realist film, um, The Quiet Man. <laughs> uh, I love that film. I know I know that film off by heart, and it, it's a family occasion. I mean, I was I was quite taken recently. Where what do we watch now? Was a question one of our children visiting The Quiet Man going right back to childhood and my own childhood. I love that film, but you don't look at that film for a realistic depiction of what Ireland is or was like. So there's a certain irony in Henry. Henry thought that this was what Ford had in mind, really. So it gets it got me to get him back on the plane into Ireland where he sees the reality and then makes his way to Dublin. And it's... Um, close enough to it's the 60s but it's close enough to the present day you know um and because it was written in the first person i had to keep him alive as long as i needed him you know <laughs> yeah so he, he has he has an unexpectedly long life uh, for, for dramatic well, i suppose less unexpected purposes. these days i mean it's not unusual for people to live in their 90s but yeah he does go he does he's a hundred and something by the time the book is over yeah. <laughs> Um, Roddy, thanks so much for answering all of the questions really and for enjoyed. such engagement. Yeah, Thank I think you. somebody I can hear, hear somebody coming in saying how enjoyable it was, and, and that's there's a whole string of comments here in the chat oh, okay. along the side about how much they have have enjoyed it. Great. Um, Thank you. And uh, hopefully, people will enjoy read the rest of the trilogy now that they've got started. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. And um, I would plead with them, don't get it in the library, go to a shop and buy it. <laughs> <laughs>